We want to optimize Black maternal and, health, um, maternal and infant health and sexual health. We also are no longer only focusing on birthing, birthing people, right? Like we have reproductive organs that people should use for pleasure and for joy and for well-being. And well-being is not simply um, looking at health attainment, but how do we create a system, an ecosystem that allows for all people to thrive? So that's mental well-being, that's financial well-being, that's all the other things that we are robbed because of these oppressions. So that means we have to shift systems and cultures through training. We do a lot of training, a lot of research, technical assistance, policy, advocacy, and it's always community-centered. Um, we don't show up into any meeting without having community members who've informed what we're going to say, um, what the ask is, because when we replicate the harm of just creating solutions without the community, we replicate white supremacy and we replicate this hierarchy that we all have. All right, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. I, they're reading my mind. Um, so the reason we start off with Dr. Celie Jefferson's slide to frame the conversation and level set how long this is going to take. Even our brilliant two days with all of you smart people is not going to up undo 400 years of explicit <laughs> oppression, right? So on this idea that even getting the right to vote, which you know for the last 14% of um, our time in the United States, yes, we've had the right to vote, but it didn't change this devaluation of our bodies, period, right? This idea that we were somehow broken, that has not changed yet. So if we're really gonna see a future, it's not gonna just be policies and laws that have to pass, but that undergirding cultural belief and a hierarchy of human value based upon skin color, that has to end as well. Next slide, please. So as um, I've had the honor of presenting to the UN, um, I, you know, I've, I testified in front of city council as a New Orleans uh, health official. I've testified at the state house in Baton Rouge as a city official, state official. I've, a, I've testified in front of Congress now four or five times, but going to Geneva, it's deeply humbling as a black woman, right? Um, going outside the US context and understanding a global context and really learning all of the kind of the things you hear these kind of like, oh, American exceptionalism is not a real thing, right? Well, this is one area that's true. We do not operationalize a human rights standard. Think about all the ways that we all fight for civil rights, right? So black folks fought for the right to vote. LGBTQI communities fight for the right to be able to be married. Um, Women, white women had to have permission of their husbands in 1965 to buy birth control, right? Because they were considered to be not able to make their own decisions, right? Our constitution said black people were two thirds human, right? So this idea in the United States is prove to me that you are valuable enough to get these rights. Sue me, go to Congress and get something, but your innate birth does not mean that you have value, not in this country. Every other country with wealth, that with high income that we are, they believe just by birth, you have a human right to thrive. And their job is not to dictate how it should look like or who has value or not. Their job is to support your well being. So, those countries make very different investments when it comes to health. They do things like free college, free childcare, free paternity leave. We're just begging for maternity leave here. They, in those other countries, they pay for a partner to be able to stay home as well. Because the, the thing is they don't believe they can just look at you and decide you are valuable, so therefore I should invest in you. They believe every person there is valuable, so their job is to invest in their well-being. What does it look like for the United States to model that a diverse nation, right? A diverse nation, diverse in race, ethnicity, religion, um, gender, geography, can believe all people can thrive. That's the challenge. That would be exceptional because most of those countries are very one race or not, right? So how do we really see diversity as something you can actually invest in for all people? Next slide, please. About 26 years ago now, there was an election happening and there's a lot of conversations around reproductive rights. You know, as an OBGYN, and especially right now, I'm in a lot of conversation around reproductive rights. Um, and so, you know, for Black women, though, this idea that reproduction is only around contraception or abortion never resonated, right? I have a 10 year old son. I do not allow him to play outside with a toy gun because, like Tamir Rice's mother, I don't want you to see him as an adult and shoot him, right? So, for a Black mother, we worry about outliving our children. So to make our reproduction only be a, 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 a um, kind of only siloed into access to contraception and abortion ignores all the other parts of our lives and our identities and all the other ways that being a black woman 
um, that it shows up in our ability to have health outcomes. So for us, we also know that there were rights and laws that said you can own us, rape us, take our children. So just because something is legal doesn't mean it's just, right? So we'll never believe that right is the thing that I'm fighting for, but I will always be fighting for justice, right? So reproductive justice is a framework that was created by 12 black women. And um, Dr. Loretta Ross is pictured here. This is a book if you wanna read it. Um, it's a primer around reproductive justice that she wrote. Uh, but the tenets are the right to personal bodily autonomy. So how that shows up in our work is if patients don't want a C-section or patients don't want an IUD or patients don't want their leg amputated or whatever, it's their body, their choice. Your job is not to call the police, call the lawyer at the hospital, tell them what they should be doing. Your job is to actually um, appreciate their wishes and follow them. That's hard for us as providers because we know best always and we're gonna tell you what you should be doing. Patients actually know their own bodies and should make their own choices. To have children, um, I have three children and they were all here for Mother's Day. And when they're all here, I personally feel like the little old lady who lives in a shoe because I'm like, who had all these kids and who, when did this happen? I don't know, who's their mama, right? But other people have eight, 10 kids, that's their choice. I cannot make my choices be theirs. It's not my job to blame, shame, make policies and culture choices to say you should only have two children. That's my own belief. That shouldn't be something I make into policy that dictate for other, but yet that's been the American way, right? We have policies dictating how many children people should have and who should have children. To not have children, I use my own state of Louisiana up until we did Medicaid expansion. There was no way you could qualify for Medicaid if you were not a child bearing adult. So think about that. If you don't have a uterus, that means you're never gonna qualify because you have not child born. So that means no men qualified, who, no matter how hard they were working in the same hotels that y'all love to come lay in and go to Mardi Gras parades and jazz fest, right? Flipping your burgers, right? So they, they, don't, they don't deserve health coverage. Um, or if you are a woman who never bears, you utilize your uterus to birth a baby, you're still, you're not valuable at all just to get health insurance, right? So this idea that we only care about you for the utilization of your uterus to birth a baby that makes you deserve it of health insurance is in policy. We made a cultural belief in white supremacy culture into a legislated policy. And this last one is really important, especially at this moment in our world where we're really looking at undoing the harms of colonization, undoing the harms of, um, of, uh, of global anti-Blackness. We want to parent our children in safe and sustainable communities. So that means if we show up at your abortion rally, you gotta show up at our a Movement for Black Lives rally. Like you understand that our identities don't just separate. We're not one thing or another, we're all things. So it's intersecting oppressions. Um, you have to do the work together across issues. Next slide, please. So when we started, we didn't have a definition for birth equity. I love that you went through those definitions, right? So we looked at these definitions for health equity, for equity in general. We looked at our own mission, vision, and values and said, okay, what definition for birth equity really matches our frameworks, our mission, vision, values? Um, so we, don't, we really don't believe that there'll be this place that we're all equal. And we're gonna hold hands, sing Kumbaya, and ride off into the sunset. Because we know, especially in our current political environment, has shown us you get a few steps forward and then 10 steps backwards. We also know that the same people who are today hoarding power and wealth are teaching their grandchildren how to hoard power and wealth. Be clear, I know lots of them, right? So if we wanna fight for justice and joy, we have to teach our grandchildren how to fight for justice and joy as well. So that means we have to put the assurances in place. The policies, big P, like, Health care for everybody, health is a right. You are deserved no matter if you use your uterus or not, no matter if you are working or not, that you deserve to be healthy, to have health. Or policy little p, like what are your hours? When do you make people come in for appointments? Do you offer, do you offer ways for them to see you in non-traditional nine to five times, right? So those are assurances of the conditions. So it's not personal choice, personal behavior. It's not tribal, right? It's our job to put the conditions for optimal birth. So we don't want people just to survive a pregnancy and say, oh, thank God I made it out of that clinic. We want them to thrive. So that means we have to be willing to address both racial and social inequities in a sustained effort. So. I do a lot of work with the IHI, you know, C plan, act, do all this rapid cycle, 90 days, none of that is gonna fix this. This is gonna require sustained commitment to undoing the harm that has been done for generations. Next slide, please. 
So that means we have to know the difference between an indicator and a framework. And this one, um, as my young folks would say, is where the money resides. This slide, this is important because we are all operating under a framework of white supremacy culture. So almost all of the choices that our healthcare systems make, that our policymakers make, the default without thinking about it is who's valuable, who's valued, whose identities are most important. And we make rules and structures and policies really baked into that structure, right? Under that framework. And we don't even think about it. It's just, it's like breathing for us, that's normal. But what if we had new frameworks? We have new ideas, right? So what indicators would we use? So an indicator is a data point. It's a measurement that's limited by our current reality. It's a product of our past understanding of public health and science and systems, including all of y'all, including me, are more apt to adhere to prescribed indicators than to determine alternatives. So I'll give you a couple that are my pet peeves because you know we all have pet peeves. So one is pregnancy intention. We love measuring pregnancy intention. We've been measuring since about 1970. Started off, you know, during kind of the Nixon um, era. It was a family study, and it was this idea that if you just intend, if we could have all pregnancies that were just planned, everything would be great. Now imagine that. We want people to have middle class intentions without middle class money, right? They should just plan better. They should just, just know better. When when should a person who is differently abled ever intend? Are they gonna? Is their ability gonna magically change? Like, how? Do, what are we investing in when we say you should just know better, right? So that framework is is um is part of white supremacy, right? Control. You should do better. You should plan. Even reproductive life planning. All of these things. Our last president showed us people with power don't need a plan. They just have power, right? So this idea that you should just get a plan and then have no access to power or resource is also flawed. So a framework, it expands our understanding of our current reality. It allows us to think of new indicators. We don't have to keep measuring pregnancy intention. 50 years is a good run. Guttmacher has stopped doing it. We can all stop. We can explore alternatives to data collection and application. And we have to question our current historical um, construction of our healthcare system, right? So. If we weren't measuring planning or reproductive intentions, what about measuring well-being? Right? Then we would have to look at things like, what is the system doing around mental health care services? What's happening with child care services? How are we supporting people's transportation? As long as we make it about individuals' intentions and not the structural well-being, you're never going to get to equity because we can't, none of us are going to plan our way out of racism. We're not going to plan our way out of gender oppression, right? So all of this has to be done structurally. Next slide, please. I have no idea. This probably had a thing. Okay, great. So um, this is actually from the Mich Michigan Public Health Institute. And it's probably the slide that people most remember me by. Usually when I'm doing it and it's a PowerPoint, it has animation to it. So you know, back in 2005, I was the city of New Orleans maternal and child health director. And you know, in this New Orleans, so it's 2005. So you know what's happening around the city and the world. And um, the president flew by and waved at us, right, from Air Force One. But the World Health Organization actually came to the city, sat in a room where I got to be the young person in the room taking notes, where they were talking about this idea that it wasn't your genes or your choices that cause health disparities, but these things called social determinants of health, things like having a living wage having a job security, having availability of food, and that the, without those things, you have a psychosocial stress, and that's where you get a disparity in distribution of disease, illness, and well-being. So this is like transformative. This is huge. It's the idea that it wasn't just Black folks had a Black gene, and so therefore we got, so we retained salt across the middle passage, and we all just gonna have hypertension. No, having lack of access to availability of food and quality education, that's why we currently not the middle passage, currently today, are having higher rates of hypertension, right? But what we haven't had a conversation about since 2005 and six, when WHO really created this definition around social determinants of where they come from. Right now, when you ask the average person who can rattle off this sentence about social determinants, they then do things like give you a um, Uber or Lyft voucher because they're like, oh yeah, transportation, that keeps you from being healthy but they don't explain the reason that we have a poor transportation system in this country is because of redlining, because of the uh, history of sundown towns, because of still today, we shut down housing projects in the, across the country 
displace human beings in Chicago, DC, New Orleans, and then don't create any way for them to get any transportation to get around, right? So those are policy choices. That's not people's individual behaviors or their genetics. We as people, as policymakers are making those choices. And those are things like our labor markets, our tax policy, our social safety net. In the US, they have three main root causes as to why we have these inequities and these disparities. And those are racism, classism, and gender oppression. You could add some more. You could add, especially in my home state of Louisiana, you could add religious fundamentalism. You could add casteism in another context. You could add tribalism if you're on the continent, right? But if you don't undo the root causes, all you're gonna do is make programs now around these social determinants. So you're gonna say, oh, here, here's your Uber and Lyft voucher. Instead of say, hey, Mr. Mayor, why don't we have access to subway stops in the parts of the city, DC, New York, where the people have the most births and the worst health outcomes. They also have the worst access to transportation. That's policy choice. Next slide, please. And so that's how that shows up in my work as an OBGYN is when you show up and you're like, man, I hear all this data around black women dying in childbirth. Tell me doc, what are my risk factors? So what we will say out loud to you is having eclampsia or having high blood pressure and a seizure or having heart disease or being obesity or having some chronic condition. What we don't talk about are things that are your social risk factors, like having unemployment, having rigid scheduling. If you can't miss work, if you make $7.25 an hour and you having to come downtown for an appointment and you have no paid leave, because paid leave is not just about after you have the baby, how are you gonna come in for your appointments in the first place, right? And you have that schedule keeps you from being healthy. That's, not a, that's a policy choice that we've not invested in paid leave. We've not invested in people being able to miss appointments food insecurity, like all environment. We know that higher rates of heat, heat increases your risk of maternal and infant death, right? So climate change, all of those risk factors are there that we don't deal with in our healthcare system. And we stick to these high blood pressure, cardiac disease um, because we feel like we can control those things. But if we don't fix these social ones, we're never gonna be able to control any of these clinical ones. So we, we are deeply tied to this entire system. It's our job to be a part of all of this. It's not somebody else's problem, it's our problem too. Next slide, please. So racism affects our body both directly, right? So me worrying about my son playing outside means my heart is racing, means my catecholamines are racing, means I'm always in fight or flight. I've normalized, as most people of color have, <laughs> I've normalized this feeling of sense of urgency at all times. And it's like a background humming noise, right? That's humming is increasing your rate of hypertension, diabetes, stroke. And we're always trying to counterbalance that and find spaces of safety, but it's difficult to do in a, in a, when we have a global anti-Blackness happening, right? Or indirectly through policy choices around things like access to high quality schools, safe neighborhoods, good jobs. So both of those are social determinants of health are um, affected by racism. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, I think um, Dr. Peek already went through Dr. Kamara Jones' level of racism. The only thing I'll add, because I present behind her quite a bit, and um, for internalized back in January 2017, uh, here we go, great. Back in 2017, um, she was the keynote and I was the afternoon delight. So we were in San Francisco and she gave her definitions and she didn't change in her slides internalized, but she verbally changed it. And so I told her I'm going to change it on my slides and you, she said it, so I'm keeping it. <laughs> but for people of color, for Black folks especially, we've always understood internalized, right? This idea that if you live in a place that devalues you, you're going to start devaluing yourself. You have to fight really hard to find things about yourself that you could like. If every image of yourself is something negative, Right? How do you raise black boys to be proud of themselves if every image is that we're hoodlums and thugs and we're only good at rapping and playing basketball? Like, where is the space to find joy in blackness? So, of course, we might start doing things like not want to live near other black people, right? Move into another neighborhood, try not to sound a certain way, trying to straighten our hair or lighten our skin. So, that's internalized racism, like devaluing our own self because the world around us has devalued us. But what she added on her slide, or in her verbally, but has not changed, written, was for the non-stigmatized group. So for white folks, this idea that you're entitled to things because you are white is also killing you as well. So it makes you do things like vote against Obamacare because that's for black people, even though you live in a place that needs Medicaid expansion and your family members are dying for hypertension and diabetes, but that's for black people, right? 
or makes you do things like raid the capital, right? So this idea that whiteness is entitled to something is killing white people. That's why we see deaths of despair. That's why we see an increase in the opioid epidemic. So undoing white supremacy is actually not just for black folks. It's for white folks too, because y'all are dying. And you're dying at rates that you should not be because of this entitlement and the belief that you're supposed to have things. Next slide. So this shows up in our policy. So I talked about reproductive justice. That means I have to talk about reproductive injustice, right? So how do we get here? The top picture is a picture of um, either Lucy, Betsy, or Anarka, three black women who were enslaved, who were um, treated by plantation doctor, Dr. J. Marion Sims, who's the father of modern gynecology, who did multiple dozens of surgeries on them without anesthesia, even though anesthesia was available, um, cutting fistulas, sewing them back up, the transatlantic slave trade, had ended, but slavery was still legal. So the economic engine of this country was black women's uteruses. That's real, that's a fact. And so in order to keep that economic engine going, gynecology had to make sure that we were able to see to have babies and produce babies that would work in, in for free to build this nation, right? And so what we have is uh, this praising of him as this founder and this dishonoring of their bodies. And so much so that he wrote down and it was still taught that black people can't feel pain. We have different pain receptors. And you all probably know the study that showed that the medical students um, still believe that. I would argue the reason they even say medical students is because staff and faculty refuse to answer surveys. It's not just, they learned it. They, the medical students are not aberrations. They learned it from staff and faculty and deans who are also believed that we don't feel pain. It's just easier to make medical students fill out a survey, right? So we also know my own university, Tulane, where I trained um, Dr. Cartwright created a disease called drapedomania, put it in textbooks. If a slave wanted to escape, you could give, you can cut off a toe. If he looked you in the eye, that, so there was an illness for wanting to be free called drapedomania. And then the treatment was all this harsh um, physical abuse, cutting off a toe, put, laying you out in the sun to get more sun, um, cutting, uh, giving you more lashes, right? So this, once again, policing black people's bodies, just wanting to be free and want to be seen as fully human because you, we were devalued. And really this whole system around family planning, this idea once again, that if you just plan better, your life will be better. There's a lot of poor people in the hood who have no children. So just having fewer children was never gonna get us to economic security and freedom. Next slide, please. Um, back when I was a resident in the late nineties, there was no disease. It was just crack mamas and crack babies, right? Um, illicit drug use was assumed to be higher in black people, even though the data did not support that. It connotated um, careless black mothers. Um, they were said by the highest level of government and our first lady said they were gonna be super predators, burdens on long-term federal assistance. Pregnant drug users were convicted as killers, as drug dealers, as child abusers. Some of them are still in jail today, right? Mass incarceration of black mothers through random drug testing, leveraging child removal and incarceration. What do we have now, right? Even on the previous administration, White women are America's sisters and daughters. Opioids are an epidemic of despair. It's considered a disease and not a moral failing. There have been no conclusions that they're gonna be a long-term burden on society, right? Um, under Trump, $45 billion spent on substance use disorder. The Southern states that led in criminalizing black women are now softening those things. West Virginia, they have a NICU for opioid babies to detox where they have room for the moms to room in. It has lower lighting. I'm a part of things with ACOG where hospitals get positive points if they ensure that the birth mother who is opiate addicted takes home their biological child. Just close your eyes and imagine that if in 1989, a hospital would get points showing that they were doing a great job if they ensured that a black mom who was crack addicted took home her biological child. If we had taken that level of care and concern 30 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are today when it comes to opioids. So it's not that it's not great that we're doing this now, but racializing it 30 years ago made us now have to create a system around substance use disorder that we should have created before, before we were criminalizing people, putting people in jail, devaluing them. So it always comes to bite you in the butt when you take a thing and racialize it, it's gonna come back to harm you in the end because now we're dealing with something that we could have fixed a long time ago. Next slide, please. So my favorite book is Ibram Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History, History of Racist Ideas in America. He won the 
American Book Award from this book. He's now written How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, he's at Boston University and he leads the Anti-Racism Institute there. He used to be here in DC and I got to do work with him around maternal health. And people would ask him all the time, like what came first, racist ideas or racist policies, right? Chicken, egg. And he would say, people use them, no matter chicken, egg, people use them for their own self-interest. So politicians use racist ideas to get more money, um, cap, I mean, uh, to get more political power, capitalists use it to get more money and cultural professionals use it to get more influence, right? So you can say things like, we gotta build a wall. And there's a group of people who for that resonates and that gets you more buy-in and people hear it because it's been going on for so long, devaluing one group and one group being more powerful that it makes people feel a part of something. What we have when people are using racist ideas to get more money and power is we have accountability, we have collective power to say, we see you. We see you trying to make us fight each other. We see you saying that it's not, it's some black people that are or people from current across the border that are taking jobs versus actually investing in a, a living wage for all people, right? We see you using these um, untruths that are harmful, that are trying to make each other fight each other versus us really having the collective accountability for you being able to become wealthy or have more political power. Next slide, please. So we're working on respectful maternity care. What's missing from the care of Black women is their centered voice, validation of experience, freedom to choose and be informed. Black women need respectful care that is free of implicit and explicit bias. It's the provider's responsibility to address those biases, to address the issue of maternal mortality. We need care that originates from and is led by Black women-led organizations, practitioners, and community members. Next slide, please. So respectful maternity care is a global term that was created by the White Ribbon Alliance and the World Health Organization. And it's usually done in low income nations as if when you have wealth, you're magically all respectful. Coming from a non-centered community in a wealthy country, we are clear that having money doesn't make it magically respectful, right? And so how do we really have this idea of the desire to have respectful maternity care? That's a global term operationalized in a high income nation. This is diverse as we are. Next slide, please. So we interview black birthing people across the United States to see what their experience of birth is. Um, we listen to them, we trust them, we're responding to them. We use our frameworks around reproductive justice, cultural humility, not cultural competency. I can't become competent in another country, culture. I can humbly always know it's lifelong learning. And then I enter the conversations knowing there are things I'm not gonna know, things that I, you're gonna have to explain to me and teach me. And so that's the kind of cultural humility we black people want for you as well for ourselves. I um, mean, really to develop quality improvement. You can't have quality improvement without equity. They don't exist. So many times we work with hospitals and systems and healthcare providers and payers and they have a QI protocol and an equity protocol. If you're working on things for black and brown people, they're one. We can't have a QI initiative that doesn't undo racism, that doesn't work on ensuring that people are, are implicit and explicit biases are done because there's no protocol that's gonna work to close a gap without undoing those harms. Next slide, please. These are the cities and within which we interviewed black birthing people around what respectful maternity care would mean to them. Next slide, please. These are some of the themes that they told us. They want accountability. They want empathy. They want you to actually care about them. They want to feel safe. They understand racism now too. They're learning that language that we're all learning. And trust, and this was a really important one for us to really re-examine as providers, our relationship with patients, especially right now. I'm so tired of hearing another, I do another talk around, why don't we trust the vaccine? Why, where it's about Tuskegee? Why don't we trust healthcare? Patients want us to trust them. We don't. If you write non-compliant on a chart, what does that mean? Have you talked to the patient about why they weren't able to come? If you couldn't write non-compliant, what would you have to do? That would be the question, right? Do you trust that when they are not at an appointment, it's not because they just don't care about their self or their baby. Do you trust that they're doing the best that they can? Do you trust that they are working in a, in a space, in a system that does not value them? Do you trust that they are telling you truths, that they um, know their body more than you do? Just because we've memorized muscles and nerves and blood vessels doesn't mean that we know people's individual bodies better than they do. 
we don't trust patients. And so reframing that bi-directional trust and not constantly saying, why don't the patients trust us and really re-examining, do we trust patients is so important for us to ever get to respectful care or to undo bias or any of these things. Next slide, please. This is our cycle to respectful care. It was just released for publication, which I should probably send you all the um, cycle. <laughs> but at the core is your oath. It could be your Nightingale oath as a nurse or your Hippocratic oath or as a black physician, your Imhotep oath, right? So what is your core value set that holds you together? Um, the beginning is waking up. And that could be that you watched the murder of George Floyd and said, you know what? This is real. I, I need to do something different. Or it could be that your boss says, we looked at our numbers. Black people are doing poorly when it comes to cancer and our system, and we are going to wake up and do better. Either way, I don't really care if you do it with yourself or your boss tells you to, but the first step is waking up. And that means you have to get ready. So that means doing internal work first. We get asked a lot to come help some system or some place go work with the community. If you are replicating the harm, if you have not undone your internal beliefs and challenging the belief that Black people are broken, that we have different kidneys, different lungs, different pelvis shapes, as long as that's still in your head, I don't need you to run out and try to do some equity strategy, some anti like work on your own reading and learning first, then work with others, then go out in the community. And it's a cycle, it's not a hierarchy. You're not gonna do it and then check it off and now you're the best. I'm constantly unlearning things, especially my biggest thing right now is working on gender. Listen, my daughter will tell you, me and my uh, heteronormative cisgendered Southern black self, <laughs> I'm like, okay, they, I'm working on it, I'm working on it, okay? So it's lifelong learning. All of us are all working on it. Next slide, please. This is what we believe is key to um, having holistic paternity care, that you have to believe that the mother and the infant are at the middle. So that's why the language matters, how you think about and conceptualize your work, where you see yourself, right? Do you see yourself as above the patient and providing information that they should listen to and honor? Do you see yourself as part of a team that surrounds the patient? So we believe that it's really um, more of a team around the patient. The patient is the lead, the mom and the baby. Next slide, please. And when you have that, you have um, increased risk, especially when you have birth support, birth workers, you, we see decreased C-sections, increased um, quality improvement and long-term system transformation. Just in that changing of how you position what you think the role of the provider is instead of that your job is to be a part of a team. It changes so much around orientation. Next slide, please. And this is my last one. So in the book, Ibram Kendi um, separates folks out into segregationist, assimilationist, and anti-racist. And he follows several people in the book. And um, he follows Angela Davis, he follows George Washington. He's a historian, so it's like deeply historical book with like all these real historical pages. You know, it's an OBGYN, it's heavy, so it took me a long time to read. You might wanna listen to it, <laughs> um, but it's a lot of detail, but it's fascinating. So one of the people he follows is Abraham Lincoln, you know, as a black American whose family has been in this country for at least seven generations. Gotta love Abraham Lincoln, right? Freed the slaves, yes. Thank you, good old Abe. But clearly he was complicated. So near the end of his presidency, the five top black folks came to the White House. Y'all can picture, I can picture it. They're like, yes, we're winning. We're going to the White House. And he's like, hey guys, of course they were all guys. Cause you know, we can talk about gender in a minute. Um, he's like, hey guys, I have a few million dollars. Liberia says you can come back or you can go to Panama. I don't really care, a black or brown place, just not here. Can you take all your people and go? So the black guys were like, hmm, that's interesting. We've been here for 250 years building all this for free. We think we want to stay. And his response is what's so critical, especially to all of us as we continue on this journey to undo racism in healthcare. Because although Abraham Lincoln was a good and kind man and a moral man, his response was, but guys, you're being so selfish. If you would just leave, the war would end. Because he believed we were broken. He believed we'd come to the US, we'd done our job, we built this country, and now we need to go back to a black or brown place or some other place where other non-white people were, right? Because he was a segregationist. Um, there are people who believe if we just be closer to whiteness and act more like white people, we'll do better, right? Those are assimilationists. If you are in this work, we don't need you to be believe we're broken or that we need to go back somewhere and that we just act more like whiteness or 
to change our language that we'll be better. If you're actively anti-racist, all that means is you understand that we are fully human and can thrive just as we are, that we are valuable, that there is no black gene, there's nothing broken about us, but there have been policies and cultural beliefs that have been trying to break us and that we're all doing this together. And that's it. Next slide. Thank you.